Hello and welcome to my channel, I am Zodiac Bandit, and today we're going to be recapping episode 109 of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. Let's get into it. We start in the Fey Realm in the Ligament Manor. The party wake up after a night of rest. Fern and Ashen wake up to the breathing of Gloom Glut. Both Fern and Ashen say that it was a very comfortable sleep. Fern says that she thinks she needs to let Gloom Glut go. Ashen says that uh, she should at least give him the choice to go or not, and Fern agrees. Ashen says once this is all over, he'd like to come back to the Ligament Manor. He likes his place. Fern says that she likes it here as well, and uh, he can come back whenever he wants. She hopes that they can all make it back after this. Ashen uh, does too, and says that he didn't think that he'd make it this long. People from Greymore normally don't get a great path, and he's got a good one. He has seen a lot and done a lot of stuff since he's left there. Fern says that uh, now he's also going to save the world. Ashen says that he'll save her, but he's not too sure about the world. At this moment, Gloomglut wakes up. Uh, both Fern and Ashen fall off him as he just doesn't seem to notice that they were on top. Gloomglut sniffs the area a bit. Fern asks if he wants to leave, and he looks at her a bit shocked. Fern asks how she's going to see him again later if he does leave. He makes a loud barking sound and uh, indicates for Fern to do the same, and she does. She mimics it a little bit, and he shrugs because it was okay. It could have been better. Fern takes uh, the bottom frill of her dress and puts it around Gloomglut's wrist, just so you know she has he has something of hers. He then looks to Fern and seems to be waiting for something. She asks what he wants, and he looks at Fern, waiting for permission. She tells him to go and spread his legs and to show the world who he is. He takes off into the sky. Both Ashton and Fern watch as he screeches off in the distance, making other birds fly away from him. Fern wonders if he'll ever come back, and Ashton says that he will for her. Fern wonders if Gloomglut could have been helpful, but thinks that it would have been weird as he didn't really want to be there with them. The party then all gather in Nana's main living space. Nana hopes Fern enjoyed her stay and asks if they'll be leaving soon. Braeus joins the group a little bit later with a little bit of a limp after his adventures last night. She says that she'd love for them to stay, but there are more pressing matters. Jenny says they have to get back to Vaselheim and tell the others what they have learned. Imogen thanks Nana for helping them again, and Nana says that she's been taking a note of the tally of favors. This concerns the party quite a bit. Braeus asks if uh, she can send them back, and she's, uh, she says that she has her ways and she can deal with the time dilation for them, just to make sure that they aren't sent 100 years into the future or something like that, or that they aren't messed up and sent like 100 years in their biological clocks or some shit. Lana sends a message to Fern, secretly, and asks if uh, they should ask Nana about the Matron of Ravens. Fern says yes, they should. Lana then mentions to Nana that they might see the Matron later, and asks for any information that could help them uh, in their meeting. Nana says that she is a fickle bitch, but they aren't on good terms. Nana is a borrower of her skin without her permission. The Matron would see her as a pest, and Nana sees her as a frustration. Fern asks uh, what Nana thinks of the gods, and she says that they don't really bother her, uh, so she doesn't really care. Take them or leave them. Lana asks, what about the connection to the Unseelie and the uh, the gods? Nana says that the Moonweaver and the Archart uh, have domain here, so some beings might be wrapped up in their dealings. Chetney asks if the gods were to leave, would their gifts also leave? Nana says that she believes magic was around before they were, uh, but the Archart just showed people a path to using it. The Ley Lines and some of the Fey Realm were around before the gods, they just affected them and changed them. Birdie at this moment enters the room. She just wanted to say goodbye before Fern left. Ollie thanks the party for protecting their daughter uh, and asks the party to get them some pastries as they can't get them here in the Fey. Birdie takes Fern's hands and says that uh, when this is all over, she looks forward to getting to know her daughter better. Fern would like to do the same, and they hug. Ollie hugs her as well. Fern tells them to be safe, and Birdie says the same back and tells the party to keep her safe or Nana will turn them inside out. And we're all fully aware of what she can do now with the loom, so probably best to listen. Meanwhile, Orm is in the corner looking at Zathuta's sword. He asks if Fern wants to uh, keep it or not, or if they should leave it with Zathuta, because he's still here as a tapestry. Tapestry, not tapestry. Uh, Fern doesn't think it's for her. Chetna suggests keeping it for other people, like different parties that they run along or rung into along the way. Lana suggests keeping it or absorbing it later, before the raid. Fern casts Identify on it. 
The blade is called Dusk Hunger. It's a plus two sword. As a bonus action, it can be set aflame with black flames to add 2d6 damage. And it's a legendary fey weapon. It can also magically blind someone who it hits. There's a chance to do it, not guarantee. So it's like flame tongue, but can blind people. So that's kind of sick. Uh, they talk about who could use the sword, but Chetney says they should just hold on to it for now. They have two other groups that might be able to use it. Vox Machina and the Mighty Nine. Imogen says that they have a ton of magical stuff that they should be using the harness to give them bo uh, bonuses to. And they can only use that harness so many times in a day. They start to make a quote suck list. I'm not even kidding. Of magical items that they can absorb. They go over the items uh, they can suck up. There are too many for me to list right now. I will let you know when they do decide to suck those weapons up. Uh, they choose to absorb an item right now. After some talk, Dorian will absorb the harp. Dorian asks uh, if Nana minds, and she says that she likes to watch. Creepy. They put the harness on Dorian and put the harp in the funnel. The light glows and the arcane glyphs light up as well. After a minute, the harp is absorbed and destroyed. Dorian gets a plus five to his HP permanently, advantage on attack rolls and saving throws, and ability checks until his next long rest and a permanent advantage on performance checks, which is insane for a bard. The party choose not to continue absorbing anything else today. Nana says that when it's all over, she'd love to have a look at that thing. Nana asks if they'll be on their way, and the party say yes. Nana stands up and holds out her hands and, and waves them. Uh, her floor opens up to a portal to Vasselheim. The party jump through. Brea says that he'll call Nana, and she'll, she tells him that she he knows where she is uh he jumps through and fern gives her a kiss and nana tells her to follow her impulse and then she jumps through the party step out onto the streets of vasselheim the people are walking around and they're still tense the party can see that uh the city is filling up with armed forces ready to fight many flags still fly beside the platinum sanctuary people notice them and nod imogen asks if ladna wants to go talk to a god and the whole party are excited to do so they head towards the uh, Machen of Raven's Temple. Moving through the streets, uh, they see soldiers, or the numbers of soldiers have tripled since they left, which wasn't that long. They see many uh, crypts are still blocked off and guarded. Imogen asks what caused the, the zombies to attack. The solstice normally threw off magic, not added to magic. Chetney wonders if there was something keeping them dead and was weakened due to the solstice. Fern says that Chetney asks a good question about what happens to magic when the gods are gone. Ashen says that magic comes from many places, including their own magic. Imogen thinks that divine magic would be weaker, but not gone completely. Orem says that it's really unknown territory, so they can't really tell. The party continue through the Dusk Meadow, a district of Vasselheim. The party look and see a massive looming building, elevated above other buildings in this part of the city. Very Victorian in its design. It's the Raven's Crest, the Temple of the Raven Queen. The party makes their way to the Raven's uh, Crest. They find a wide set of stairs going up that reach very large glass doors that are opaque. The doors open as they get close. Orm says this makes the one they went to in Whitestone look very small. Chenny asks if anyone needs to stay outside to keep others from intruding on their meeting. The party do not think that's necessary. Thorin asks what exactly they're going to be trying to get out of this. And Chetney says to confirm what the Archart said was true, as they believe that she is the other person that the Archart was talking about. Imogen wonders if she's expecting them now after their talk with the Archart. Doran wonders if she can give them the how to the Archart's what. Lana says that she was mortal, maybe uh, she can give some pointers on things. Chetney says to keep what the Archart said a secret just in case she's actually not on his side. They'll agree uh, just to hear her out and head inside. The doors close behind them, and the doors looking out are actually transparent. It's like a one-way mirror sort of thing. Or a two-way mirror? I've never understood which one it was. Anyway, the interior of the cathedral is long is a long, continuous hallway filled with tons of candles along the walls. As they push forward, the black architecture fades to a more ivory architecture. The hallway ends at a staircase that goes upward. They don't see anyone else in this building. They go up the stairs and find a massive oak door. Lana grabs the massive knocker on it and attempts to knock it, but she can't really lift it because the knocker's heavy, so Ashen helps her. With the two of them combined, they knock. 
Uh, the sound echoes throughout the temple, and the door opens. They enter into what is a a hundred foot tall steeple with stained glass. They look at the glass, but it's hard to understand and make out the images on it. They see more candles along the walls, and they see in 20 feet ahead of them are three figures wearing jetpack black clothing with armor and dark crowns. One calls out to them uh, and steps forward, the center one. She welcomes them to the raven's crest. Jesus. Uh, she says that her name is Liev Tell. She says they have had an eye on them since they arrived and asks why uh, they are in their abode now. The party can't tell if these are the same three that were in the Platinum Sanctuary or not during the meeting. Chen uses the monocle that he has to cast Sea Invisibility. He sees how, that there are many enchantments all around this chamber. Uh, he makes a Arcana check to see what types they are, and he can tell that there is some Conjuration, Abjuration, and Necromantic, all weaven into the stained glass. And maybe that's why it's so hard to understand what the stained glass images are, because they're woven into the stained glass itself. Imogen says that they got pulled towards the matron. Liev Tell says that they all do eventually. Imogen says that they have a feeling that they uh, have to speak with her. Liev says to commune with her is a leap of faith. She steps aside and they see a wide pool of crimson liquid behind her. Lana says that uh, they've had a few signs to talk to her before. Liev says that they should uh, then speak with her and gestures to the pool again. Imogen asks what they have to do, and Liev says to sink and release. The matron exists between life and death, and to speak with her, they must do the same. The party get ready to jump in. Brass asks if this leap of faith is a promise to follow the goddess, and Liev Tell says no. The party, for the most part, take their clothes off and start to head into the pool one by one. The blood is very cold, and the scent of iron hits their nose immediately. Brass gives Ladna inspiration, and Fern gives her guidance. Ladna goes below, and some of the others follow. Dorian gives himself unending breath before he goes below. Cheater. Uh, but before Chetney goes down, he uses his Hunter's Bane. He rolls a 19 on his Perception check. He can tell that the blood is celestial in essence, but can't tell its origin or if it's been swapped out recently. And then he goes below. So whoever is down below open their eyes and they see that it's dark around them. They look up and see the light and above them is whoever jumped in the, the pool after them. Brass and Orem haven't gone in yet. They aren't quite sure. Brass uses divine sense and sees all sorts of shit around him. A flicker of undead beneath the water is the biggest thing he can tell. Orem offers some of his blood. He takes out seedling and cuts his hand open and drips it into the water or the blood kind of ruining the celestial vibe Orum, and then the two go in as well fern is the last one on top she watches the splash from brass as he goes in and it goes into the air and then stops and then falls back in she then tastes the blood very copperish and then goes in herself they all sink in and they all feel that they are being pulled downwards eventually struggle hits the party and they try to swim up but they can't lana doesn't struggle she accepts this feeling they all eventually let go except for Dorian. He can no longer feel his friends around him. He notices that his unending breath spell, or whatever the hell it was, uh, is definitely keeping him from doing whatever this was supposed to be, and he lets go of the spell and then eventually lets go of it all. He is hit with panic and fear, but lets it happen eventually. He does find comfort as the cold pool becomes warm. It's a comforting feeling, a familiar one, like they've been there before and they will be there again. They each feel their feet hit a surface, and the floating cessation ends. They feel their weight come back to their bodies. They open their eyes and they see an endless uh, red pool around them, and they can see each other. They see a faint f flicker of a reflection and then another. They focus and they see a spider web-like thing made of gold. It's an impossible array of golden threads. It tightens and strains, inky black begins to spill out from it. It spills onto the red pedestal that they are all standing on. Lana goes to touch and grab one of the droplets, and as she pulls her hand back, there is a single raven's feather. She looks up and sees a massive person before her, a white face mask looking at them. She asks, Thrice, have you sought me out? Why? Lana says, The first two times were merely coincidence, this time was very much intentional. And this time, they felt like she wanted to talk to them. 
The Raven Queen asks where they heard that she wanted to speak with them from, and Lana says that they met with the Archheart, and they aren't the God-fearing type, uh, so the people that are before her might be the best for any missions that she wants them to do. The Raven Queen asks if they came all this way to be cell swords, and the party say no. Lana said that they have some questions and want to co- corroborate what the Archheart said. The Raven Queen asks what he said, and Lana just says that he said the gods are scared and they aren't in agreement on how to handle Perdathos. Lana says that they've been to the moon and there is two Ruidas born among them. She says that Orem got a sign from the Wild Mother to fight for them. And she says that the Archheart seems keen to turn and run. The Raven Queen asks if that means the Archheart is the dissident among them. And if he sent them here, uh, sent them to her. She becomes massive and almost becomes the realm. They are ants before her. Lana says that he made it seem like the two of them were in agreement. Imogen says that they watched her put an imp in her titties. Uh, that's a downfall reference. The Raven Queen says uh, they speak of events before their time. All threads are tangled, especially these times are in these times. Why are there is no different? To make accusations of her family. Lana says that accusations haven't been thrown around. The Archart said that she'd be willing to talk. Lana wonders what he saw being born from this conversation. Brea says... They don't know uh, anything. They're trying to figure things out. He says they've been, uh, they've seen many things, and they just want answers. The person they saw might not have even been the Archheart. Orem says that they are being pulled to the center of this mess, and they just want to understand what's going on so they can best help everyone. The Raven Queen says death can't be stopped, only delayed. Death co- uh, concerns her awareness, but she is just its steward. She also looks over fate. And to do that, she must look for patterns. She opens her hands and the party see the golden threads again. Some snapping and some attaching to other places. She looks at it to see where it might lead them all. She looks at Fern and says that she might know a thing or two about fate. They have a natural arrogance of mortals about them. She's watched many heroes climb towards greatness only to become dust in history's memory. What makes them different? Lana says that they don't want to be heroes. Dorian says... Uh, They're just looking for what they can do tomorrow. The Raven Queen says to heed her words and go home, and she begins to drift away. Imogen asks where that is, and Fern slaps the pool beneath them. Asha says the Archart was going to let them die until she convinced him otherwise, back in Downfall. As she wasn't done playing God yet, the mask drifts out of the shadow and stares at Ashton. She asks what they want. Orm says that she was a mortal once, and she worked with them, and one that she worked with could use her help right now. He says they still have a chance to live a life, but before they die, they're trying to maintain the balance. Her balance won't break. Imogen says unless she wants it to. The Raven Queen says that they walk towards a golden haze where even she can't see. They've fallen in destiny uh, to those who come to her in her realm scared and aimless. Orm says it's not aimless. She walked both paths. If anyone can understand them, it's her. Does she even have a perspective anymore? She says the saga of gods and their fate have ruined many before. Some still need to prove their impact. Color swirls in front of the party, and before them is a worried Liliana. The Raven Queen says a woken child of the... God Eater, forced to leave her life and follow destiny, what will she do? Feed or be fed upon? More color swirls in front of the party, and they see the Opal dark and still. Opal born fractured, a dual soul, manipulated by cult and betrayer gods alike. To walk a path of violence without agency. A pawn for the gods. Others pursued the promise of the gods. Their presence inspired covetous jealousy and world-shattering ambition. Flames curl behind Liliana and Opal. And then Vespin Chloris appears. He tried to rewrite history himself from the shards of the Raven Queen's path, becoming the first catalyst to calamity, damning himself and many others to the hells. The history of Exandria is altered by those touched by the will of the gods. She asks them to prove to her why they are worthy to be among them. Imogen says that Ashen and Fern both have shards of a titan in them, and Ashen has been remade many times. Orm is a protector, and she's never met someone as noble as him. The Wild Mother agrees. Fern is a collector, and everyone she meets gathers around her. She has many people that she can call upon. Braeus is strong and is of two minds and great turmoil inside. 
They want him to choose the right path, but no matter which path he walks, he walks strongly. Dorian stepped up every single time. He's a prince, something he shies away from, but his entire being shines with it. Lana is everything. She had her fate thrust upon her, and she embraced it. She became stronger than it and overcome it. Chetney is old, and he has seen uh, so much and acts like a jackass, but that's because nothing can break him. The Raven Queen asks what of Imogen herself. Imogen says that she has a storm inside of her that she can't wait to let out. The Raven Queen says that they all step on the edge of the world on a teeter, and if they fall, they'll fall forever. They choose similar paths to the ones that they see before them. Let's hope that they have the strength to endure and persevere where they falter. The Raven Queen pulls back. An image of Liliana shifts, and her hair lifts up, and her eyes begin to glow red. Opal, the black ink falls down under her body, and her blades come out. Fern goes up to her uh, and is hit by Opal's blade that goes through her hand, taking seven damage. Opal looks at her without recognition. Her eyes look like a collection of a dozen eyes, like spider eyes. Vespin Chloris exhales, and it's time to roll initiative. A dope map, simple map, but still really dope, comes out. Initiative rolls, Braeus a 22, Dorian a 21, Laudna a 21, Chetney a 17, Orm a 17, Fern a 17, Ashen a 10, and Imogen a 9. First up is Braeus, he rushes Liliana and swings with, which misses, and then he swings again and hits, adding Divine Smite uh, and something called Shining Smite, which is apparently from the new rules. D&D Beyond is weird, I can't believe they mixed the two things together like that. And he adds a charge from his weapon. He deals 49 damage, and until the spell ends, attacks against Liliana have advantage, and she can't turn invisible, and that's because of Shining Smite. Dorian is up, he runs for Opal, he takes out his father's blade, and swings and misses with a natural 1, but gets a reroll because of Aurum, and he hits with a 25, dealing 8 damage, and then he does a defensive flourish, which adds 6 more damage, and then he swings again for 11 damage, hitting, well, yeah, he hit and then did 11 more damage. He then attacks with his offhand weapon, uh, and he hits, dealing five more damage to Opal. Lana is up. She casts Mirror Image on herself and casts Bane on all of the enemies. Liliana fails. Vespin fails. Opal saves. Lana then runs towards one of the golden threads. She doesn't see any threads going towards their enemies. Liliana is up. She floats into the air. Uh, Brace gets an opportunity attack. Uh, he hits, but she casts Shield. She flies up, and everyone needs to make a dexterity saving throw. Braeus fails, Fern fails, Ashen fails, Imogen fails, Orum saves with a natural 20, Dorian fails, Chetney saves with a 24, and Laudna fails. So everyone is now floating into the air with reverse gravity, which is a dope spell. They're 100 feet in the air. Opal is up. She then casts Hex on Chetney and attacks him uh, twice, critting on one of them. He takes 12 damage and 16 damage, respectively. Chetney is up, he transforms, and he, he then attacks Opal. He misses all three of his attacks. Orm is up, he runs up to Opal and casts Hex on her. He swings and hits, he makes it a disarming attack. She fails the disarming and takes 22 damage and one weapon and falls. He then does the same thing, hitting again, uh, making her drop her other blade, dealing 23 more damage. He then hits again, dealing 22 more damage. Orm is cracked. <laughs> He stabs into her and then pulls the blade out, and then suddenly spider legs emerge from her being, turning her into a drider. Awesome. Fern is up. She summons Mister and casts Aura of Life on herself. Vespin then casts Time Stop. He then casts a few spells rapidly, and there are suddenly four Vespins. He casts Mirror Image on himself, and rocks floating above his head. Uh, and people in the air need to make saving throws. Ashen fails, taking 63 necrotic damage, but it's halved because of Aura of Life. It's a 31. Braeus saves, taking 15 damage. Fern fails, taking 31 damage. She drops her spell, but they've let her keep that up for the uh, halving damage for the rest of the people who are taking damage here. Imogen fails, takes 31 damage because of the Aura of Life, and it's now Ashen's turn. He rages, he holds his action because he's waiting for Imogen to do something before he does anything. Imogen is up. She gives herself fly and she activates a lightning aura. I believe this is her havoc form, but I'm not too sure. She then flies down and sends a lightning line at Vespa. It's not a lightning bolt. It's a lightning line. 
who fails and takes 23 damage. Ashen then uses a wormhole strike to hit Liliana but misses. He then tries again and hits this time, dealing 22 damage. She drops the reverse gravity spell. Fern and Ladna both cast Feather Fall on everybody as they begin to fall. Ashen uses Shattering Blow to teleport Liliana to him. Dorian grabs a hold of her on the way down. Braeus then uh, runs up to Opal. He casts Ensnaring Smite on her. Sorry, Ensnaring Strike on her. And hits, adding Divine Smite again for 21 more damage. Opal fails a Strength save and she's ensnared by the Vines. Braeus swings again. Hitting, adding another Divine Smite for 45 damage. Braeus is fucking cracked. Dorian is up. He activates his uh, winged boots. And he gives Imogen an inspiration and flies over top of Liliana and casts Thunder Wave going down. He deals 27 damage as she fails. And she is pushed 10 feet away. She's now 20 feet up from the ground. He then moves closer to Imogen, but not too close so he doesn't get hit by lightning. Ladna is up. She summons her Hound of Ill Omen and sends it to Vespin Chloris. Lana then casts Fireball on Vespin, or at Vespin. He fails and takes 36 damage. Uh, maybe he probably resisted it based on how Matt described it. So half that. Uh, the Hound then bites at him and hits, dealing 8 damage. Lana then backs up a bit. Liliana is up. She looks at Dorian and Imogen. And Twin Spells Psychic Lance at them. Imogen saves and takes 13 damage uh, as she has that kind of damage. And then Dorian fails and takes the full 54 damage and all the other effects of the good old Psychic Lance, which is a fantastic spell. Opal is up. She attacks Chetney, misses three attacks, and then crits on two of them, dealing 15 damage, and then hits the last one, dealing eight more damage. Chetney is up. He ignites his flame, or he ignites his claws with ice, not flame, which is not ignite. I guess he freezes his claws. He then swings at and hits Opal, dealing 19 damage. Orem is up. He attacks and hits uh, her again, dealing 14 more damage, killing Opal. The legs fall and sink into the pool and they begin to be dragged down by these hands that come out. The last thing Orm hears from her is why. Orm then Misty steps over to Vespin and runs the rest of the distance. Where he lands is next to the ledge of this uh, pedestal. So he has to roll a dexterity save to not fall off, which he saves. He then slashes at Vespin for 17 damage. Uh, Vespin fails the goading attack. Orm then swings again and then hits for 12 more damage. Uh, Fern is up. She casts Flame Strike on Vespin at 4th level. Dexterity save. He fails. He takes 17 fire damage, which is likely halved, and 16 radiant damage, which seems to be, as Matt put it, super effective, as the Pokemon fans would say. So, that was probably double damage, so made up for the half damage. Mister then sends a Flaming uh, Seed at Vespin, which misses, and Vespin catches it and throws it aside. Vespin is up. He looks at Orem. He aims a Black Bolt of Lightning at Chetney, Brass, Ashen, and Fern. Chetney saves and takes 25 damage. Brass fails and takes 51 damage. Ashen saves and takes 25 damage. Fern fails and takes 51 damage. Vespin moves around Orem. He grabs a stone above him and throws it at Orem, hitting. Orem takes 40 damage from this thing. Ashen is up. He rages again to change his rage and then runs towards Vespin and dashes to get to him. He reaches the ledge as well and needs to make a deck save because he doesn't want to fall off either. He saves, and that's the end of his turn because he had to dash to get there. Imogen is up. She moves up to her mom and shoots lightning at her. Uh, deck save, natural 20, so Liliana takes 11 damage instead of the 22 that she should have. Uh, Imogen then turns to Vespin and quicken spells to cast lightning bolt at 7th level on him. He fails the save and takes 43 damage. Brass is up. He moves up to Vespin, Missy stepping to get there. He then attacks Vespin and hits, adding Divine Smite, dealing 34 more damage. He swings again, hitting. Uh, hitting. However, one of the duplicates actually takes the hit. Dorian is up. He can only move, so he flies into one of the threads. As he hits the thread, he's hit with a shock of memory from Opal, including her climbing in the Hellcatch Valley with others getting ready to fight, which means that's where Opal is currently. Ladna is up. She takes her form of dread, and then she moves up and looks at the matron. She says, 
They know a few things about her many forms, and she casts Spirit of Death and makes it look like Amira, the Raven Queen's mortal form from Downfall. Uh, the mask shudders a little bit, and so do the golden threads. The blood beneath them begins to boil. She sends the spirit to Vespin. Amira then does a uh, multi-attack on him. She hits uh, with a scythe, by the way. Uh, the first attack dealing 12 damage, and the second attack hits, but it hits a duplicate. The Hound is up and misses their attack. Liliana is up. She says, Imogen, they gotta get out of here, and asks if she trusts her. Imogen says yes, and then Liliana casts Power Word Stun on her. Chetney is up. By the way, the Power Word Stun works because she was below 150 health. Chetney is up. He moves to Vespin. He attacks two times, hitting the first one and the second uh, hitting the first one and he hits the second one but the second one hits a duplicate the first attack deals 20 damage to vespin killing vespin chloris this is the second time that travis has killed vespin crazy and for a brief second the timelines cross and Sarah appeared orm is up he moves uh his hex to liliana and then runs up and jumps into the air and swings with an air slash he hits with the first one making it a goading attack dealing 25 damage he then hits with the second attack, but she shields. He then hit, crits the third one, dealing 34 damage, killing Liliana. Imogen comes to and sees her mother's legs drop from her torso before she burns away. They all breathe in, and they see the mask is now gone. Orm looks back to where they started and sees the Raven Queen at a human size. She walks to them, and she says that she needed to see if they were capable of doing what needs to be done. They are very close to their enemies who will try to do things to them in the upcoming events. She says that she did call for them, as she has a parallel opinion with the Arch Heart. The cycle of divinity and mortality, life and death, but it doesn't stop them from manipulating things. Uh, the gods have grown stagnant, unchanging, while the mortals are the ones that are bastions of change and evolution. She pulls her mask away and they see a pale, sad woman. She says that she's grown tired and she welcomes them to the conundrum. Imogen asks if uh, she knew what would happen to her champion, and the Raven Queen says no. When he became champion, uh, she could no longer see his thread. But what made him a good champion also made him impulsive and prone to manipulation. He doesn't deserve what he's enduring now. Ash or Orum asks if the Raven Queen would leave this place like the Archheart. She says that they would get rid of the Divine Gate and deal with Pradathos themselves, but they need to be in total agreement to do so. So the two of them, the Archheart and the Raven Queen, are actually holding them up. They are keeping them back. She says that she has a unique perspective. She's the keeper of fate and she wants uh, fate to decide the future this time. She doesn't wish to die, but she wants the people of Xandria to decide, but she won't flee. Which is far better than what the Archheart said. Braeus asks, even if Pradathos is released, she won't flee. She says that the Golden Haze is exciting and she's very clever, so she doesn't really need to flee. Braeus asks what happens to uh, the afterlife once she's gone. She says that Exandria's natural cycle would reestablish itself to what it was before the one who before her came and changed it. The substance of the soul is forever and it will find its way. Fern asks why she became a god. She says many will speak of her ambitions some of what they say is true she wanted to see if she could do it but she did it with his help the one who came before she went to him in his enclave trying to get the secrets of divinity they danced for years he might have seen her as a disciple but they became friends and the raven queen thinks that she might have loved him orm asks uh, how she took his place and she says that he helped her make the rite of ascension orm asks what happened to him, and the Raven Queen says that he found peace. Fern asks if she can still feel him, and the Raven Queen says that she does feel him in the echoes of her work, and in the cold of winter, and in the shadows of the corner of this realm. Orm asks if she feels for him still. She says maybe, but she feels for many things like them all. Ashton asks if it's worth it for her in the end. She doesn't know, and that's why she's so curious about things. Orm asks... Uh, what she knows of Pradathos. She says that she he was before her time and the knowledge was kept from her until there was uh, no way to hide it from her anymore. What she does know is whatever Pradathos is, it's bound to where they came from. 
Imogen says the Arch Heart wants uh, them to set it free to become a vessel. Imogen asks how they could do that without dying. The Raven Queen says the same way that she did it, and that was love. What she has here is more resilient than they give credit for. Lana says that she loved the one that she became, but they don't love Pradathos, but they do love each other. The Raven Queen says that that should be an anchor for them if they choose that path. She wants them to pick that path. They want She wants them to pick what is right. That some of them are on the side of trying to allow that to happen, them being the gods, while others are trying to break down the wall. Imogen asks if they are found out, will they become betrayer gods? The Raven Queen says those who write the books change history. If she becomes the villain, that's fine. She still believes in them, the party. Orm asks if they can undo the binding with Pradathos, and she says that anything is possible. She shows them the golden threads, and the realm of shadow becomes a golden light. She says that she was born and raised teased and underestimated, and now she is here, because anything is possible. Jenny asks if she can give them anything a, to tip the scales. Uh, she says that the reason the gods fear Pradathos is because he unravels them. She doesn't know what she can give them that won't uh, that he won't do the same to, but she'll try. She holds out her hand, with a mask in it. Braeus goes to take it. She pulls her hand back slightly and says that he's at a crossroads and maybe this will be the nudge he's looking for and hands it to him. It's very cold and smooth. She says in the moment of need, wear it and call. Uh, she's not sure what will come depending on where they are. Chenny asks if uh, an extension of his life is possible and she says that she'll see them all eventually. Lana asks if they are to remake the Rite of Ascension, but the Raven Queen says no. It's not possible to be remade. She made sure of it. Lana asks what happens to her champion if she leaves, and the Raven Queen doesn't know. She likes not knowing. It's new for her. Dorian uh, asks when was the last time she was surprised, and she says three decades back when a mortal sacrificed his love to protect those uh, that were his world. That's what makes them special. When the gods try to determine their worth, they defy them. She thinks that's a sign that they should stop forging their future. Dorian says that's the best part, and hopefully she can feel it again soon. Orm asks if she misses being immortal. She says uh, every moment she knew what she gave up to do this. She says uh, who knows what her place would be in this system. Will the system no longer be? And if it does, they better tell them why it's still here and renegotiate the terms of their agreement. Chenny asks how to save Vax, and she says to destroy the key, but remove the beacon first. She says that there's a device beyond their understanding, and she creates a 12-sided shape in her hand. Imogen asks if uh, she can cut Ludinus's thread now. She says that she can't. He is clever uh, and is beyond their grasp, but not the party's grasp. Ashton asks why the gods fear the beacon so much, and she says it's because they do not understand it. Imogen asks if they should trust Liliana and Opal. The Raven Queen says they know them better than she does. Uh, she just needed to make sure that they can uh, do whatever it takes, including taking out those they trust or love. Ashton asks if Latna is going to be okay. She holds up her hand, and out of it comes a silver thread that connects to Latna. The Raven Queen says her fate lies between realms, or at least it did. And then she spins her hand and turns golden as it reaches toward Imogen and then it webs out to the others in the party. The Raven Queen says that she's a victim on she's on a path of righting what had been wronged to her. Lada asks if she continues down this path, will she be whole again? The Raven Queen says anything is possible. She takes the mask, Ladna takes the mask from Braeus, holds it up to her face, and then puts it back down again. Ladna hopes that she gets to see him again, and she deserves it. The Raven Queen says that she deserves little, but she remembers what it was like to fight for one survival. And she says that she has her ways. She tells them to go. They all lose their footing, and they are consumed by the blood pool beneath them, and they begin to swim up, and they emerge out on the floor of the Raven's Crest, and here is where the session ends. So there you have it, episode 109 of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. I am very curious as to what people think of this episode, because at first, I was a little... I don't, I don't want to say, like, annoyed with the fact that the other god who was working with the Archart was the Raven Queen, because it just didn't make sense at first. 
But as time has gone on and like she explained more of her feelings and how it's not exactly the same as his, she has a very different one because of her different perspective because she was human first. I kind of like it. I kind of, I'm kind of a fan of where she's going with this because she's giving them the option where like the, the wild mothers like fight for us and the arch heart is like, don't fight for us, make us run. The Raven queen's in between. She's like, I'm giving you guys the option of either. I just wanted to give you both or, or give you more information on both sides, which I thought was very unique and very cool. And I like the idea that she's sort of, she and the arch heart are holding off the rest of them by not being in total agreement, which I'm a big fan of the idea. But I'm curious what did the rest of you think? Because at first, like I mentioned, I was a little annoyed by it because it didn't seem right with her character. But after everything was said, it made a lot more sense. So yeah, I very much enjoyed this episode. I thought the fight was really fun. I very much enjoyed like them walking through the cathedral. Like the imagery of like raven's crest to me is really badass i don't know why i just really like the the bloodborne-esque imagery i keep seeing in my head for it but yeah curious what you guys think of this episode be sure to let me know in the comment section before i go i do have one more thing i want to sort of bring up and it's sort of channel related so if you're if you're just here for the recaps and don't care about the channel the videos or anything like that don't worry about it you can peace you can head out but for those of you who are, you know, who have been around on the channel for a while, I've been thinking about opening up this channel to members so that you can join the channel and uh, become channel members for whatever the price is. It would be like the lowest thing I can do. Um, but the reason I've been thinking about it is just because like to grow the channel more, eventually I do need to spend money on the channel. So like that would be one thing, but I also want to do more with it. So if I were to open up the channel to memberships i want to do a lot more with it like streaming or just other sort of type uh, sort of type of videos I, mean, I don't know if i want to do like members only videos because that just sounds kind of cringy to me to put something behind a paywall but you know i would like to do more streaming or stuff like that and maybe i've been messing around with ideas for like contests i know that sounds insane because i'm a super small channel but i have a big ambition but anyway, I'm just curious what you guys think of the idea, if you have been around for a long time, if you would be, you know, interested in something like that, where I do stream stuff. The two two things that came to my mind immediately for streaming was Baldur's Gate 3, because obviously, like, D&D related, big thing, it's huge, and we'd pick up Minsk eventually, so if we could have Matthew Mercer on the party. And I was also thinking about playing The Last of Us, because I haven't played those yet, and I would love to play those, and Ashley Johnson's in those games, so if you like you know, quick roll related. So that'd be cool. But I'm curious as to what you guys would think about that. Should I open it up? Would you guys be interested in that? Let me know. So with all that being said, I will see you guys on Tuesday for whatever video I make next. Peace.